get us started. All right, welcome everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for showing up and coming. We're very excited to talk to you about the Shibboleth IDP UI. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're gonna go through the webinar today. Everybody will be in chat mode. So using Zoom, you'll have that chat function to go ahead and load your questions. We do have specific um, point in time during the webinar where we will be taking those questions. So don't worry, we'll keep an eye out for them and get to them as we can and assuming time permits. So with this said, we're gonna be doing it a little bit different. For those of you that have seen our demonstrations, um, that's not what we have in store for you today. We are going to be sharing the link at a later time during this session today so that you can go out and get an end-to-end -end, uh, review of the demo of where Shibboleth IDP UI is. Uh, but, today, but today really is about sharing where we are um, what we've heard so far from the community as far as new things coming up and really to hear from you. Are you really interested? Are there additional um, schools that are getting ready to adopt the Shibboleth IDP UI? And then what questions do you have and how we can help you? All right, so this is our agenda, a little bit more detailed. Um, I'm actually going to be handing it off to one of my teammates, Jonathan Johnson, the architect on the Shibboleth IDP UI project. He's going to be sharing some user interfaces with you. So some examples of actually what the Shib UI looks like. We then are going to shift into the features discussion. And that's where JJ is going to talk about some of the highlighted, the core features of what is in the application today. He's then gonna shift over and talk about some of those um, new requirements. So things that we've heard from the community from several institutions that if I had X, I would adopt. So we wanna bring those up and see if there's any feedback on those and if that really uh, resonates with you and makes sense and is something that would add value to you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what's next and a little bit more about how Unicon is really here to help you and the overall community when it comes to Shibboleth. So with that said, I'm going to introduce JJ. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Sharice. The Shibboleth IDP UI, or as we like to call it, the SHIB UI, was designed to allow our IDP operators to have a simpler interface for their day-to-day -day tasks. As an IDP operator, we often get in and need to do things only just a couple of activities 90% of the time. So the biggest thing that we typically do is an integration of and SP doing kind of a bilateral integration. So these first couple of slides here, or these first couple of interfaces show that we do allow folks to import metadata into the SHIB UI, allow folks to manage those metadata files and to mark up and edit those metadata files as well. The second big, and if we can move along to the next one, the second big activity that we do is if we do integrate with federations out there, say in common, we might go in there and modify our metadata provider configuration as well. So another activity that the SHIB UI allows you to do is go out there and configure the various types of metadata providers available in the Shibboleth IDP and allow you to set up metadata filters so that you could go in and mark up metadata that you might not have access to yourself. A big use case for this is setting up entity attributes that you can use to drive something like your security policies or your attribute release policies. Excellent, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other features that are out there. Like I mentioned, we do provide support for man management of your metadata sources or your metadata files. We also allow management of your metadata providers. On top of those metadata providers, we do allow you to modify and manage your filters again. A big use case for that is setting up your security policies or your attribute release policies for those. Another feature that we got from the community and that we have implemented is delegated administration. 
so that the IDP operator is free to allow some of their constituents to come in and register their metadata files with the system. On top of that, delegated administration is a simple workflow that allows an IDP administrator to review those metadata files before they're actually activated, enabled, and sent out to their IDP for consumption. Along with setting up those metadata files and those metadata providers, we do provide HTTP access to that configuration. By virtue of that, we do set up an MDQ server if you wanted to provide access to your metadata files through that protocol to your IDP. So that's what the, uh, the SHIB UI looks like today. <clears throat> On our roadmap for 2022, we are looking at some more enhancements out there. Particularly, we're, <clears throat> we're looking at some of the new facilities, some of the new configuration that is available in the SHIB IDP version 4.1, new entity attributes that are built in, some new security policies that are available, et cetera. We're also looking at enhancing the de delegated administration, allowing for finer grain control of that delegated administration. A couple of other things that we've been asked to look at and that we're extremely interested in pursuing are the different types of metadata that are available for use in, in the SHIB IDP, particularly the CAS service metadata and the OIDC metadata, providing very similar to what we have for the SAML metadata uh, for those particular protocols. Another feature that has been requested by a few folks uh, and is kind of hampering the deployment is if you currently have an IDP out there that is you know, very mature, you might have a lot of metadata and or metadata providers and configuration that you might want to migrate over. So we're looking at patterns and options for importing that metadata and configuration into the SHIB UI as well. Great, thanks for that summary and update, JJ. So now we'd like to open it um, again using the chat. Um, if you have specific questions about anything that you've seen or that you've heard, um, we're also interested. We saw at least at the start, there's at least one person on the call who actually is at an institution that's deployed the Shibboleth IDP UI. So any feedback that you have for those others that are attending this session, that would be great. So pretty much an open discussion. Any questions, comments, feedback? All okay. right, Les, the floor is yours. Yes, no, sir. No, actually, that's, I was just, I was, okay. I was just saying, chat's disabled, I uh, can't participate. Okay, all right, <laughs> thank you. Okay. I, I will I, defer to the next actual person. <laughs> uh, is that me, Kevin? I had yes. my hand up, I did have a question. Uh, I am not currently, my site's not metadata driven. I have a line party for with hundreds of ugly quirks. Um, I would like to not being update relying party all the time and looking for sort of will this, how much will the tool help me craft that metadata driven, you know, to craft metadata files so that I can be more metadata driven, at least on a rolling forward and with a bulk load to possibly you know, manage chunks, you know, more metadata files at a time that I now have both a client's metadata and custom settings in relying party or occasionally, you know, special specialty items in the attribute filter and unfortunately even the resolver at times. So as mentioned, most of what you're controlling are going to be entity attributes out there in, in the metadata, whether that metadata is going to come from a metadata file or from 
a federation like in common through the use of filters. So one of our one of our clients that we actually moved over to be metadata driven, it ended up not being a heavy lift. Now, now to be fair, that that particular exercise was just getting them away from a ridiculously long relying parties file and getting them over to, to using metadata filters and uh, metadata driven configuration as a stepping stone so that they could then use the SHIB UI to manage that. So there, there is a little bit of work right now that would be required on your part. On your part. A little bit of that is just going to be design, design and some just architectural decisions that you would need to make so that you could easily shift over to using the SHIB UI. And I, I hope I wasn't dancing around the question, <laughs> question too much right now. The bulk import is open for discussion as well. And so any sort of feedback that you might give that might make your life easier or might make the SHIB UI more enticing, yes, we are certainly open uh, for those suggestions on that import. Hint, hint. <laughs> well, yeah. as, as, I haven't, <laughs> as I haven't used it for a small case yet, I don't know what I would want for the larger, you know, bulk import, but mm -hmm. sure. How many how many entries do you guess you would ha you have in your relying party file? Just out of curiosity, um, we've got four to five hundred entities, um, and we probably. But besides turning on Duo for some people and not others, which we have hundreds of items listed, there's probably at least sixty to seventy things that have and maybe a bit more that have something tweaked in the relying party file. Okay. And our attribute filter, certainly we release, there's a default release, and then there's, you know, a lot of people who get specialty releases. Sure. And if I can drive that from their file, and if there's a nice organizing system in the UI that has the file from the user, you know, mm -hmm. You know, this is this is not the gold standard, but it's you know the as as from user as seen on TV, um, and then the all right, what we did to make it work, you know, and then it sort of keeps them and labels them correctly and helps me organize them so that it, when if I get a a new one from a user, mm -hmm. I, I realize yeah that's another you know raw material I need to make mm -hmm. my target useful copy and. To go with that and not necessarily to go mdq which would be nice mm -hmm. but it's another couple of multiple servers to have a reliable mdq so i would just use the tool in first pass as a you know as a as an aid to massage the file and then distribute it with my standard system that i use to push changes out Oh, no. Thank you. Yeah. For yeah. Thanks for the feedback there, Kevin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were there any other comments out there? <clears throat> yeah. So right. we got a question there from William Eubank asking mm -hmm. about will SHIB UI always being play be playing catch up with the SHIB project? So yes and no. There are a lot of features that have been available to the SHIB UI for a very long time that folks just didn't use. Really what we're playing catch up on are the features that folks want or and or need. So when we talk about, uh, for instance, the facilities or the new features available in 4.1, that was a request from one of the folks that was trying to deploy the SHIB UI that some of those features folks may not need. 
So I think that that one was more, there was a specific, I should say there were more specific examples out there about for instance, the algorithm support that's out there in 4.1, and that may be enhanced in 4.2. Some of those things you can actually do with the SHIB UI today without having specific support for it. It would just require a little bit more than the pointy clicky that's a, that we try to make available through the UI. You could actually go out there and configure some of that in the YAML files that we have available to you. JJ, I wanted to also jump in and, and answer that from a little bit different perspective, right? Sure. And it kind of has to do with why we're here today. So based on the community feedback, the need uh, for this application uh, and the value for the institutions as a whole, if there's support and commitment behind it, the end result goal at some point would be to I don't want to say become one, but to align, right, with the Shibboleth Core project as it makes sense. So it's not um, that it's always being followed. And in some cases, it will, it would make more sense to follow it, um, but that things, discussions and decisions can be made together as well, based on those of you that want to utilize a Shibboleth IDP UI so that it's more of a consideration up front instead of something that would happen after the fact, if that adds a little bit different view on that question. Thank, thank you. That was going to be my second question. This is William, the one that asked the question in chat. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I would just, I, I've had the experience of using the CAS management tool on top of CAS for years mm -hmm. and trying to keep <laughs> the two happy version wise between the versions as they evolve, right? Yep. That was the reason of my question. If you're talking about doesn't support the features in 4.1 yet that's planned for this year, but does the basic stuff and is compatible with 4.1 and 4.2, that's a different sort of thing, right? That's great. Yes. 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 Yeah, yes. one of the yeah, one of the nice things, and not to toot not to toot horns here, but there were some changes in the CAS project that made CAS service files incompatible and not forward compatible. The Shibboleth project has been pretty sane on that front. So while there have been some changes, you've typically been given a lot of forewarning before those change before those breaking changes happen. Yes, I went through some of those with CAS a few years ago. That's right. Yeah, so, so all in all, obviously more support's gonna help to be beneficial and make ShibUI you know, more of a central uh, topic when things are moving forward with Shibboleth as a, as a whole. I have to be honest, I've looked around some in the past and there's been a couple of screenshots, but I'm very interested to see where it's at today, if you guys are going to demo that today. So, um, and to answer that question, <laughs> we actually have done several demos in the past and we're kind of taking a different stance today. You'll see as we continue with this webinar, what we are going to provide before we wrap up is a direct link to a recorded demo that JJ actually performed that's end to end. It's already out and available, but we're going to post that as one of the takeaways so that you can review that, share it with your teams, et cetera. And then there's also a Slack channel that's available um, through Internet 2, Shib UI IDP, that you can collaborate on and provide feedback, ask questions. So Clay is, um, he has a comment about some documentation. It looks like some was confusing and inconsistent. Um, so let's talk a little bit about documentation. Um, right now, as far as the, I guess the, I don't want to say owners, it's um, underneath the Internet 2 umbrella, Unicorn's been hired to lead the efforts on the Shibboleth IDP UI. Um, and that also includes the associated documentation. So there have been times where there's been maybe a functionality not meeting documentation 100%. Um, I believe that is all up to date. One of the other links that we are going to provide you is the um, actual download of the to be able to get to um, the, the latest and greatest Shibboleth IDP UI, but also the link to the documentation um, where it's been reviewed and updated. So um, not going to claim that it is perfect, but uh, we have done quite a few updates, and this is, again, part of the reason why we're meeting, right? We'd love to get some involvement uh, from the community overall to assist with some of that, 
um, and or just to know that it is of interest and important and adds value. And maybe we can put additional resources on it. So uh, it's great to hear and glad that people are at least looking. We want your feedback so that we can improve it and make it a great tool for all of higher education. Any other questions before we move forward? I think I want to I want to respond there to something that Steve uh, wrote there, where he has oh, you know, okay. seventeen hundred SPs integrated, but thirty one relying party override rules. There are different patterns out there for setting up those relying party overrides. In the past, folks have tried to be extremely granular, but what I think Steve is getting at there is. There are a basic set of rules that you could probably go out there, and in his case, he probably has he has 31 different sets of rules that each of his SPs can probably fit within. I mean, chances are he probably has 1,730, uh, oh, I can't even do math right now, 38 or 1,708 SPs that fit within one rule and then 30 SPs that fit in the other 30 rules out there. But one thing that you can do with particularly tagging and with your entity attributes is easily trigger those rules out there kind of like what you used to be what folks used to do with their um oh their federation integrations by using the oh now i can't it's been so long since i've done this because of entity attributes the um oh the source or the group where that particular sp came from that my my brain just lost it but yeah you could go out there in the ship ui and put your different so steve could go out there and do his 31 different rules and as an sp is integrated pick one of those relying party overrides that would be um, applied to that particular sp excellent thanks jj all right, so let's talk about what is next, all right? What is next is we need some commitment and we're gonna try to help you with that. What do we need? What do we mean by commitment? We need schools to commit that they're going to, um, you know, download, install, deploy the Shibboleth IDP UI, POC, non-prod, whatever you wanna call it, give it a shot, check it out. Provide some feedback. That can be on the Slack channel, that can be directly um, to Unicon, whatever works for you, um, but it's that feedback that's important to help us move forward and overall assist with future requirements. As you look at it, you're like, wow, if I only had X, Y, Z, you know, additional layer of uh, delegated administration, if I only had, you know, that, that bulk um, upload feature, whatever it might be. Obviously, it doesn't have to be what we've already identified with several community members. It can be something new because that's what we want. We want to hear what really is beneficial for the community as a whole. So here is the documentation and the download link. You are going to see it updated in chat. Ryan's going to place it there so you can all grab it from that specific location. So this is what Unicon is going to do for you. So you are the special ones that are attending our session today. So we want to tie really our love of the product and of the community and of higher education to really help you, right? So we know it takes time. It takes effort to do these things. We are willing to provide up to four hours of free consulting to the first 10 institutions that confirm their commitment. How do you confirm that commitment is you send an email directly to me. I will then respond just kind of reiterating that you are going to deploy it in a in an environment this year, and you are going to provide some feedback. That's all there is to it. Then we will work together based on your availability and Unicon's availability, and we will schedule that time to assist you. So this is a super awesome deal. We hope that several of you on this call are excited about that, and we hope to hear from you. So with that, it looks like we have some more chatter. I want to make sure that we answer all questions that you might have. Oh, and if he hasn't done so, Ryan will put my email in the chat as well. And then as we get near the end, so I guess I will pull up the chat too and see if we have any specific questions. The mic is open, so feel free to go ahead and reach out. Um, and thanks, Steve, for making that note that you currently deployed it. That's wonderful. 
feel free to go ahead and shout out if you have specific questions. I know that we're near the end of our time here and I wanna respect your schedules. A quick question for, for, S, for clients who don't provide their own metadata, I've, I've had a handful and I just edit one together by hand. Does, is the SHIB UI useful to synthesize that? I know there's other tools or sites where you can just plug the items in, but is that an integrated item? Granted, I don't do it much, but that, there... that was actually one of the early use cases for the SHIB UI. So okay. we actually do provide a wizard that will walk you through generating a metadata file not by hand. I mean, it's wizard generated. Yeah. Pages. We do provide that functionality. Great. Uh, Therese, if you could go back to that slide on, uh, it was the first screenshot, I believe is where it is. Oh, we don't actually, we don't actually, oh yeah, there, well, no, we don't show it there, but yeah, you have a few options on how to get that metadata up into into the SHIB UI, you could either create a new one, upload a file, or uh, oh, I can't remember what the other one is offhand. Give it a URL. Yep, there we go. Sorry. So yeah, you do have that option. Okay, great. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions? Let's see. <clears throat> and I guess a response to less, I, I think it was less's comment out there, we do actually have several patterns for integration. So however you might integrate uh, your current SP metadata with your IDP, we could probably help with. So one of the things that the mm -hmm. SHIP IDP UI can do is periodically generate metadata files for you out on the file system that you could load into a Git repo that can then be pushed out with Ansible, for instance. Excellent. Well, thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. We're excited to work with those of you that are interested. Um, JJ, thank you for walking everybody through what we have done and what we're looking at doing in the future. And we will look for those emails and hopefully we can continue to move forward and um, update the Shibboleth IDP UI so it meets all of your needs. Thank you. <laughs>